You're listening to Dots, Lines, and Destinations, a travel podcast with host Stephen Seagraves, Fosma Moon, and Seth Miller. Hello, and welcome to episode 425 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. I'm Stephen Seagraves, joined this week by Seth Miller and Faz Mahmood. Hello, gentlemen. Hello. Morning. Seth, you sound a little better. I am a little better. I'm not all better, so, you know. Do you still feel like crap? I'm just fatigued, I think. Mm -hmm. The congestion's gone. Occasional still, like, lump in my throat. But, yeah, getting better sucks. Did did your wife catch it as well, or were you, like isolating uh isolated in the house yeah. so so she's she's helped managed to not get sick this time she actually got it a couple weeks ago and i didn't manage to not get sick back in january so wow wow well that's good that you're recovering slowly yeah, yeah. well it's had it has meant some canceled trips for me so that's been interesting yeah we have to talk about i mean you've got i think it's a topic right when you yeah a little bit yeah um let's first talk about st john's airport uh had a fire which like Fires happen, I guess. This was surprising to me. They, uh, this is the airport out in Newfoundland, sort of way eastern Canada, and big enough, significant enough issue is apparently something started in the ceiling above one of the gates mm-hmm. in the passenger terminal, and significant enough that they had to close the terminal. <laughs> so everybody, you know, everybody evacuated and is safe, but it has meant they had to halt passenger service to Newfoundland for a couple days. Wow. Which, you know, I know it's one of those like, oh, sure, whatever, like the airport closed. But when it's your only real connection back to the real world and so far away, that's kind of crazy. Yeah. I mean, it says it's we're recording this on Sunday morning. It it says it's going to be open tonight. Uh, Probably. Probably. Yeah. No, there's no confirmation or or firm answer. Yeah. So it's just, uh, I don't know, one of those things that made me think of just how isolated one can get sometimes. Yeah. Have you guys have you guys flown into St. John's? No, no. I, I've like, wanted to. <laughs> See, most of the time people end up there in Gander. It's by accident. <laughs> I want to do the Heathrow flight. Is it still running? I think they've stopped it for now. Um, but I'm sure at some point they'll bring it back. I think that's the slot they're using to do Heathrow Bombay right now. Interesting. Yeah, I know. Um, so that was Air Canada used to operate St. John's to. Uh, Heathrow, and there've been some. Some of the shorter Heathrow flights went away. I guess is mm. from Canada, right? They used to get a seven thirty sevens, and it was right. That was the other thing. Is it was a small plane. It was a three nineteen. Uh, and what I didn't know until recently is they never sold it as um, business and economy. They sold it as premium economy and economy. Yeah, because it wasn't the bad, right? Hmm. And is I mean, how short of a flight is that? It's like four and a half hours, five. Yeah, if that max, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, so Air Canada this year's got Halifax, but that's it. And since WestJet revert, you know, has not reverted, but con- collapsed back to the West, it can't. They canceled all their flights from the east half of the country. Looks like at least for April. Um, yeah, WestJet's only flying from Calgary now, so they used mm-hmm. to have, I think, a Halifax flight too. Mm-hmm. But the the Halifax flight is a seven thirty seven max. Interesting. That's a that's a little. I mean, it's a little further, right? Like you're maybe an hour more by the time yeah. you climb and everything. Yeah, and is marketed as premium economy cost. There you go. Wow. So Six hours, hours, five hour fifty block time or five hour fifty uh, flight time from Halifax to Heathrow. Oof. Yeah, and that's a, that's also it's a daytime flight, but it, uh, that should be gate to gate. Yeah, airtime. Departure time is 11 o'clock a.m. local, arrival time 9 p.m. local, so it's a daytime. Oh. Yeah, it's not too bad. It's one of those, I, if I could get the Boston to Halifax connection, I'd consider, but if, I'm, if I remember correctly, last time I looked, they missed connect it by like 15 minutes each direction. There, There is there is a uh, ferry from, uh, what is this, the, I guess New Brunswick or Prince Edward Island? Is this Nova Scotia? So Nova Scotia to... Newfoundland. Yes, but that's, you know... Probably like a three-hour trip. Certainly longer than flights. Reminds me of when we were in uh, Yellowknife and the ferry couldn't fly any... uh, The ferry couldn't run because Mm -hmm. it it was... This was U.S. Thanksgiving, so late November, uh, and it started... The Great Slave Lake started to ice over, so they stopped (laughs) running the ferry. But it wasn't iced over enough that they could start running the trucks across it. (laughs) And... 
that but the city got cut off. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, most goods arrived either by ferry or by truck and they started to run out of stuff. And like part of that was the bar across the street from the hotel where we hung out every night slowly, but surely was running out of different beers. (laughs) Like every night you go in and like one or two more kegs would have a pint glass over the tap showing that it was kicked. Um, You'd be like, we we start worried when the food goes. When they say no yeah. more French fries. Honestly, I was more worried about the beer going. Um, <laughs> but they eventually they were worried they were going to run out of petrol, gas for cars, yeah. and yeah. you know, supply various bits up there. And they ended up ch- the city, I think, chartered a plane to fly in a tank of gas. Hmm. Not like, cheap. Not cheap at all. Uh, it was pretty funny though. Uh, yeah. 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 I mean, I guess Gander's on the same island. So, worst case, you go to Gander and drive down. It's also still snowing. Like, they got eight inches of snow the same day. Yeah, so it's not the greatest conditions here. Yeah. You should go to Gander and wait for the United flight to show up. Right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Um, <laughs> what about I add a season shift? Uh, what, what do we got there, Seth? There's a uh, new route. There's new. This is this this is weekend. This past weekend was the season shift, so we are now in the northern summer 2023. I had a schedule, which means all the airlines and routes and you know slot controlled airports and things like that all had their changes. So, uh, what were some of the fun ones? United's Dubai route officially launched over the weekend. I missed. I was actually adding that to the show notes as you spoke because yes, that happened. Newark to Dubai is now a thing on United. Yep. Um. That was one I can think of. There's a uh, JetBlue now has a daytime flight to Heathrow oh. from JFK. Hmm. They're up to three a day there. Um, all the Russian airlines have moved to DWC, the other airport in Dubai. And have, Why do you think that is? Um, I assume money. Cheaper to operate out of there? Yeah, it's a cheaper airport. and uh, But Emirates is also increasing service from... DXB, the main airport, up into Russia. So, oh, interesting. Okay, um, but I assume it partly it's mon- mostly money related. Yeah, yeah. And they're also generally flying smaller airplanes and to smaller cities in Russia. So, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. makes some sense there. Uh, what else was interesting this year? Uh, oh, Hartford to Dulles is back. I uh, know Dulles, Dublin is back on Air Lingus. Mm-hmm. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah, so that had just launched, I think, in 2019, maybe 2018, uh, pre-pandemic, and then disappeared very quickly. <laughs> um, so yeah, that one's back this season. Uh-huh. Is that a flight? Is that a flight you could take advantage of, or is it one? Is it still too? Is a little out of the way for you? Uh, oh, they were operating it in 2018 as well. Um, Hartford is like three hours from me. So it doesn't, it doesn't gain you anything. Yeah, 27. And there's no easy way to get there without a car. Mm. Or even with the car, it's a long, it's a flat. Yeah, they actually operated that route back in 2017. So it's been a while. Mm. Been around a while. Anyway, um, I know I'm sure there's others I'm forgetting, but those were a few I thought of. I noticed the Newark flight, uh, the inaugural. Are do they not get the same special dispensation for overflying Israel because they're not going from Dubai to somewhere? Did it route around Israel? Yeah. Like took a sharp turn more south and then kind of whipped up around to to stay outside of Jordan even and then Saudi Arabia. Just interesting. I thought I thought like it was I thought Israel Israeli airspace maybe they just didn't want to pay Israeli airspace I don't know you know. Yeah, I'm not sure what was the flight number one ninety it's one sixty four. Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Um, what else we got here? We've got uh, you, 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 Seth. You believe in travel insurance these days? I do. It's weird. <laughs> Are you a shill? I am. I, I was looking earlier. I couldn't even find a affiliate link to get in the show notes quick. And, and I... <laughs> um. So t- tell me why. I mean, is it because of all these cancellations with work and uh, work travel that you had planned because of COVID, or is it? Yeah, I, and so I mean, I guess what I would say is. Going back far enough when people ask me about travel insurance, my answer was I self-insure, right? I I fly too much for it to make sense. Mm-hmm. And that always, you know, I always sort of seemed to make sense to me in in 
most cases. I don't, and honestly, I didn't have that many cancellations. The couple times I had to cancel, that was the thing. Like when I canceled, it was, I can't go, oh, well, usually. It wasn't mm-hmm. illness or anything else. It was just, I booked a mileage run and decided not to go to Rome. Our work came up and I couldn't go to Rome. And so I had to throw away the $300 ticket. Mm. Um, this, so that's the sort of things that insurance doesn't necessarily cover in de- general also. But of late, I have found, certainly with, being sick the last couple of weeks uh, and a couple other trips. Uh, I have more than covered the annual. I'm going to get my annual for me and my wife was just under $500 for an annual plan was the premium. Yeah. Yeah. And I got that paid back three or four times over, hmm. which the downside is that means I've had a few trips I had to cancel, but, yep. and I'd like to, you know, in an ideal world that wouldn't happen, but you look at, the Southwest mess over Christmas, we had, the, from the storm itself, we had flights canceled and got some refunds, but not everything. And it's the other thing is to look at, like, what would a credit card cover versus not? Yep. And both the southbound and the return trip, we had cancellations, um, which is fine, you know, get a refund, but... The rebooking cost, and on the return of particular, we ended up in Providence, Rhode Island. Yep. And so that was one where credit card insurance would have paid the hotel that night and, and our meals, but we still had to get from Providence back to New Hampshire. And a third part, that's something that credit card company typically does not cover. Yep. And third party insurance, if you get the right policy, does. And so that was one where. They covered my rental car and gas and would have covered tolls if I'd had a receipt for those um, to get us from Providence back to New Hampshire. Now, theoretically, the airline should have covered that, but we, you know, it's also the, we agreed to go on a different flight to a different place to get home sooner yeah, kind of thing. And so you, often the airline will disavow that or you can negotiate with them separately, but easier to just get it. Um, similarly, when we were in India, this is even back in 2019. We had flights canceled and to complete, you know, the cost of replacement tickets is generally not covered by mm. a credit card. And I f- was able to use that. They, you know, the airline offered to rebook us three days later when they had seats open and I found seats the next day on an alternate carrier and got them paid for. Yeah. What do you, I mean, what's the average cost, I, you know, say for two people on a trip for the, for the trip insurance? Is it like 35 bucks? So the caveat I'll throw out here is I still do annual policy. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know that it makes sense on an individual one. And I haven't read the fine print enough on an individual trip policy to know what of these types of things it actually covers. Yeah. Um but I mean I had non refunds turns out some of my hotels were non refundable or I was inside the refund window by the time I realized I couldn't go to Germany last week. And that was ended up being six hundred dollars that insurance covered. Wow! So, so that's worth it, right there. Yeah, and again, only if you actually get sick or something bad happens. So that's why they they're willing to sell the policies. They don't expect it to happen that way. But yeah, yeah. And up these days, I'm more inclined to hold an insurance policy than not. Do you do you run insurance files? Keep insurance for travel? I do not. I just rely on the credit card stuff. Yeah. Then I will say my, and I, until 2019, I never really did or rarely did. I would occasionally do it if we were going scuba diving because I wanted the insurance against uh, the decompression. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, which usually comes as like a rider on regular annual insurance policy. But uh, we were required to have it when we were hiking in the Himalayas, again, for medevac. Mm. And so the company we were hiking with told us the, you know, I think it was a fifty thousand dollar minimum of X and something else Y and whatever, and we just found a policy that fit those parameters. Yep. But uh, I it didn't need it then, or didn't need the medevac, but used it for getting rebooked around India, and then uh, figuring the other stuff out. Recently, it has come in handy. Yeah, I think. I mean, did you you didn't cancel the policy when COVID was going on, or did you? Um. I did. So we ex- our, we let it lapse for a couple of years, and then why did I bring it back? We were going. We went somewhere last. Oh, when we were planning our trip last summer, uh, which was our sort of back into travel again, we did a bike trip across France, mm-hmm. 
uh, decided we wanted to be insured again mm-hmm. because we were we were traveling together and things were happening. And the, prior to that, in the 2020 and 2021, I wasn't traveling enough that wasn't work yep. where they would pay for it if something went wrong. That makes sense. I mean, I think I think that's the key, right? Is if you're going to get the value, if it's if it's adding value for multiple people and giving you a little bit of peace of mind, I think it I think it makes a lot of sense. And it's coming handy now. So, I mean, it seems like one trip screwed up, and if you travel enough, one trip is enough to to make the policy pay for itself. So, yeah. So, makes sense. I think it also comes down to the destinations you might be going to. Yeah. Right. If you're mostly domestic, I don't know how much, I, you know, if it's family, that there's definitely value. But if it's just a single person, I don't know how much value would be there. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's, yeah, definitely like if you're going to international to somewhere that's uh, maybe not the best uh, hospital system or, you know, you may need to be medevaced out, then I think it makes sense to, and you do that a lot, I think it makes sense to keep traveling yeah. no matter what. Yeah. And, and I'm talking about Western Europe where I'd rather be hospitalized. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah, exactly, yeah. But still, I mean, it saved you on hotels and things like that. So. Yeah. Anyway, definitely not an everybody everywhere all the time thing, but at least consider me, if not fully a convert, uh, close. Yeah. yeah. What do you have next for travel then? Italy. Oh, yeah. Very nice. Going to Rome and to Venice. Uh, this actually should be fun. I was going with family for 10 days at, over in mid-April and then had a work thing come up. The third, I was supposed to come home on Saturday and had a work thing come up for the following Thursday in the Netherlands. Yeah. So instead of going back and forth, I'm just going to stay in Europe <laughs> and uh, decided to train my way from Rome to the Netherlands rather than fly. How long does that take? I'm spending three days uh, but on purpose, right? I booked a... And I've sort of asked on the internet who had good train trips that they liked in uh, in the general region between those two cities or countries and got a couple of great suggestions. So one was a friend in sort of central Italy who said, hey, come hang out with me for the afternoon. And so, yes, yes, I will do that. And so that, you know, a little out of the way. So it takes a little extra time, but going to spend a few hours there overnight in Bologna and then get make my way through to the Berninia Express I think it's called and so this is a train trip through the Swiss Alps or the Italian to Swiss Alps it sort of crosses the border through the mountains there hmm. up by San Moritz and whatnot down into Switzerland and then I really tried to find a overnight train because those are back now and apparently they're you know super super cool if you believe people it's been 24 years since I've done an overnight train in Italy. So I thought, well, hey, why not? Give it another go. And, uh, or in Europe. And it's not going to happen. There's nothing you could find that worked time north? It basically would have been four, uh, yeah, it was, it ended up being bookings on four different tickets, like unprotected connections across a 30 hour or like 20 hours on trains in 24 hours or something like that. No. No, no, thank you. And I decided I didn't want to spend that much time in trains. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then if I did that, or I would basically be not stuck, but have a day to kill then somewhere in Switzerland and then book the overnight train and decided that I'd rather spend the day sitting and traveling and sleep in real beds. Yeah. And deal with the fact that I'm paying, you know, an extra hundred euro for a hotel somewhere. So it didn't work out this time, but maybe next time we'll see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, I'll be interested to hear what you think of train kind of travel back in Europe since you haven't done it in a while. Uh, long, I mean, we did long, some last summer in France as part of that trip, but long haul stuff I haven't really done. Yeah, yeah. We're doing the train between Venice and Italy, and Rome too, so lots of options. That could be fun. Yeah, and I, I would purpose, and we're doing Pompeii for the day, so that's another tra- inner city train ride in Italy. And I was purposeful about booking both Train Italia and Italo, which is one of the private operators. Oh, interesting. Yeah, so we can do some compare and different cabins on most of the tickets. So you know, if I have to plan a trip for family and put pull everybody around Italy for the week. I'm going to have some fun with myself too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so I'm, I'm looking. Um, we've got a new fur. Uh, over Cutter. 
And for those who don't know, uh, a FER is a flight information region. And uh, they're kind of like larger air traffic and full regions for segments of countries or con- uh, a country. So in the United States, we have a bunch. Um, there's uh, Houston, Denver, Chicago, so Seattle, Kansas City, FERS, and they control generally a large bit of airspace. So uh, there's now one uh, over Qatar that extends out into the Gulf. Um, interesting stuff. I think it's a fir- the first one to be added in, in a while, right? I, I'm not sure about wh- when the last one was added. There's something else. Maybe it was just that right one over is like Somalia maybe has just become stable again. Yes. Yeah. The okay, that one already existed. Yeah. 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 Okay. So yeah, it is one of the first it's rare that one gets added just because generally speaking airspace exists and, you know, is well managed. Um, yeah. This one, I mean, so this sort of dates back to 2017 when the countries surrounding Qatar took away its airspace. They basically say so Qatar had delegated its airspace management to Bahrain previously. And then the Saudis and a few others were like, hey, we think you all are terrorists. So you we're not going to let any planes fly in and out. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And basically blocked most air traffic in and out. And they had like one escape route via uh, Iran that worked. And it screwed Qatari airspace and the airline for a couple of years. It took a yep. while to get it sorted. Uh, but at that time, Qatar basically said, okay, well, this is BS. We're taking back our airspace management and we're going to make sure we have multiple options. And over the intervening few years have pushed through the various processes with ICAO and other regulatory groups and whatnot and managed to get everything sorted. And so, yeah, as of this past weekend, they now have their own airspace to manage. Yeah, and it extends fairly far into the Gulf. Um which I'm, su- I'm surprised about. I mean, for international treaty reasons, I'm guess that's part. I'm guessing that's part of it. Um, but it's it's interesting that it extends uh, fairly fairly far into the into the Gulf and kind of over to Iran. Um, yeah. So it's 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 interesting, but kind of cool. Yeah, that's a neat one. Yeah. Um, and then the FAA gave out some uh, safety messaging. I don't yeah. know what this is about. <laughs> Speaking of flight flight operating regions, uh. This was, there was a huge, huge is relative. They had a big, like, safety summit after all the runway incursions and other things. Mm -hmm. And so on March 15th, there was a safety summit that involved airlines and various other groups. And the takeaways, the FAA has issued a couple advisories slash press releases on how to make flying more safe. And, you know, a reminder to everybody to pay attention. Mm Mm-hmm. And it's basically just a reminder to everybody to pay attention. <laughs> you know, your job. <laughs> yeah, which, like, on the one hand, yes, calling attention to the fact that people were screwing up is important. Yeah. Um, but also, I don't know. It's a it's a weird one. I often I often wonder about those things. Like in the corporate world, you know, we hear you get like the typical, well, make sure you monitor your email for whatever, and how much of that okay. actually. What's that? For like phishing email. attacks, yeah, yeah, yeah. How you know, make sure you monitor your email or whatever. But how much of that actually gets listened to, or do people just tune it out? Uh, you know, as an IT guy who deals with compromised systems, <laughs> people people just tune it out. A lot of people just tune it out. My favorite was like I was have my I have an account with QuickBooks for my business, mm-hmm. and I was having trouble, and so they like, oh well, we need to remote control your computer just so you can show us the error you're having. Sure, no <laughs> problem. Which like I'm was stupid because I was able to describe it pretty well, I thought. But, okay, fine. Go to this URL and download this remote control thing, and if you see an error that says it's not secure, don't worry about it. <laughs> like, oh, so I should ignore the error about the unsecure website when sharing my critical financial information with you as a vendor. That's not sketchy at all. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and I was not amused by that. Uh, but I will say, going back to the flight information regions, the FIRS and FERS or however you pronounce it. One of the other interesting things that came out of uh, the FAA last week is that they've admitted they don't have enough staffing to manage this summer. Oh, that's great. So after yelling at airlines for the last six to nine months about don't don't schedule more than you can staff, be realistic about what you can handle, etc. The FAA came out and said, listen, we're at 
80% staffing for air traffic control in most of our regions. Uh, the New York Center, which is N90, is what it goes by. It's like the mm. airport code. Uh, M90 is at 54% staffed. And running that low, they, they do not expect that if the airlines resume full operations, they'll be able to manage it. And so they're pre... They basically said, if you if everybody operates as currently filed, we expect 40% of flights will be delayed this summer. Oh, that's great. Um, Something like that. Yeah, it was a huge number. And so to encourage airlines to not run routes or flights that aren't necessary, essentially, right? The other challenge there is that LaGuardia, JFK, and Newark are all slot-controlled, slot-coordinated. If you don't operate your flights, you lose the slots. Yep. And there's some nuance with Newark and whatnot, but that's the, sh- the short version. And so the FAA has said, uh, we'll let you cut up to 10% of your scheduled flights if you're and you know, these slots that you basically, flights that you plan to operate as slot squatting, we'll let you get rid of those. <laughs> and so America... Pause, pause, pause is not amused. I just don't, I'm like, I, what do you even do at this point? Why I should deal with the real problem? Well... United and Delta have agreed to cut some of their site flights. American, in a letter, said, eh, we're still figuring out what our schedule's going to be. We'll let you know. They have until the end of April to make a decision. It's it's for four months. I think it's May 15th, May, June, July, August. Yeah, like May 15th through, or June, yeah, May through September 15th, something like that. Yeah. Great. Um, even more interesting is that if the route dropped included DCA at the other end, you get to keep your DCA slot too. Oh, so we know which which routes are going to get cut then. Presumably, we don't need flights between Newark and DC every thirty minutes, or United's LaGuardia to Dulles shuttle, <laughs> which goes out mostly empty most of the time. Yeah, <laughs> but it's a right. I mean, you pick a relatively short flight that you can when it comes time to cancel operations, you can quickly consolidate all the passengers onto the prior or later one easily. Right? I mean it's it makes sense in that context. And even with this, there's still going to be cancellations and delays. So, you know, relief will yeah, relief will be harder when the problem arises, but hopefully it arises a little less often. I just, I don't understand how we're at such, I mean, are, what are the other options? Because it doesn't seem like this is long-term sustainable for the FAA. Well, part of it, part of the options is they're going to transfer Southern approaches to Newark to the Philadelphia controllers. <laughs> they're moving part of the New York airspace over to Philadelphia. Wait, that's not going to be a problem when they decide to shift runway directions. It's I, I don't it's not I, I don't think it's uh final approach, but they're moving a chunk of airspace over. But most um, I think most of that airspace is already in Philadelphia. They're de- it, they're definitely moving some over, but not until they're starting training, but they won't be able to fully transition until after the peak summer runs. Um yet basically what they've come it's come down to is they say they're having trouble hiring and a combination of training was suspended for a couple of years, which screwed things up. And, or maybe not for full years, but COVID-related training suspensions definitely threw a wrench in those gears. And then various other challenges related to hiring and keeping people in the New York area. It's not a cheap place to live, and those are government jobs, so they come with government pay scale. Yeah, I'm just wondering, like, is it, but it's not just, it's not just New York. Like, they're, they are down staffing yeah, they're down everywhere, but New York has not recovered nearly the same as the others. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I just wonder, like, I mean, I guess they maybe they could bump the age up because there's an age gap yeah. or an age uh, limit on. You must the, decide you want to do this before you turn thirty. Exactly. So I mean, I think you might have to bump that number up a little bit if you want people to take the job, take the jobs. So that's a uh, that's a problem. Well, so it sounds like it's gonna be a fun summer. You guys got a lot of trips planned domestically. It's gonna be hey. great. Plan on not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm just gonna sit in my bunker. Um, it's it's the usual problem. Of you don't travel when everyone else travels. <laughs> uh, let's talk about DST. Uh, and for those who don't know, daylight savings time. Uh, it's caused a bit of a problem in Lebanon. Oopsie. <laughs> uh, this is a, it's it's a, go ahead. 
Yeah, I would say, so when you change, when you're going to enforce daylight saving time, that uh, creates all sorts of problems. In the U.S. made a change in early aughts, I think. We moved our daylight saving observation dates. Yep. And I remember having to update, you know, thousands of computers to make sure they were ready to handle the new schedule. Yep. Or at least that was somewhat planned in advance. In Lebanon, the government sort of last minute decided to not adjust this past weekend along with the rest of Europe and other countries where it typically does adjust because of Ramadan Ah. is the theory there. It made it easier for those fasting for Ramadan because the fast would end earlier. I got you. Yeah. In the day. It'd be dark. It'd be dark earlier. It'll be dark at six o'clock ish instead of seven o'clock ish, which is nice, but also, uh, is a break from all of the other organizations and countries that typically the Lebanon has coordinated with. Mm -hmm. And so things like Middle East Airlines had to decide which clock it was going to use. Oh, but the, the Christian, uh, the, the the main Christian church came out and said, this is stupid. We're not honoring it. We're going with what was previously planned. (laughs) <laughs> so people in Lebanon are basically running on either a Muslim or a Christian clock for the next few weeks. Seems like a great idea. What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah, like the airline agreed to stay or to not change for the uh, prime minister's decision, but shifted all their flights by an hour. So all the international stuff actually does land at the right time where they have slots internationally because you're given a slot. You have to operate at the specific time can you, can you imagine being the passenger oh it's still operating at the same time and then they're like well no it's gonna operate later and you're like oh so but it's, but it's actually the same time yeah exactly <laughs> oh there's no room for confusion here. no and like the news like tv stations what time do you run your broadcast <laughs> oh god but they've never so they've never done this before right this hasn't happened before the split like this yeah not that I'm aware of. No, it's pretty crazy. Ramadan also moves, right? Because it's tied to the lunar calendar. Right. Yeah. Yeah. That's wow. And it's like, why pick this year to decide that Ramadan is what you need to switch to accommodate Ramadan better? Uh, it's or if it's not for Ramadan, like why pick this year to decide to switch it? And then that becomes a question of the you know. There's a lot of discussion about whether it's basically just trying to foment another religious war in Lebanon, which is. Not uncommon, unfortunately. Yeah, but it's it's interesting. I mean, it's it's one of those questions where, um, you know, with a little pre-planning, you probably could have made this happen pretty easily, right? Like we're at a point where time zones and stuff it's 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 easy to to accommodate them. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, from from a perspective of if you if you'd done this more than a month out, people could have at least planned a little better for what. Yeah, they can handle. I mean, doing it a month out. Get, or, which, yeah, I would say you probably need to give people at least a year notice if you're going to change things. True, like true. I mean, it would be, yeah, that'd be best, but it's just, yeah, this is funny. It's, it's funny and kind of infuriating at the same time. So, yeah. You know. If time. Uh, um, what else do we have? Oh, yeah. United has appointed a CEO to Mileage Plus, something I didn't know needed to exist. I, it makes you scratch your head. I almost wonder, I wonder when we're going to see the, uh, uh, Transition from where the my, the mileage program is the key entity and not the airline, <laughs> not the rate we're going. But the the new CEO apparently comes from Comcast is, and has no experience in the world of loyalty. Wow, and Comcast is just a great company. So oh, yeah, um, are they going to show ads before I can access my account? Well, apparently he his, that his his forte is advertising. Oh God. <laughs> I mean, to be fair, Mileage Plus has run as a separate mm-hmm. business unit company within United for a long time. Has it had a CEO, though? That I'm not sure. But I know it's definitely been a separate business. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it always, uh, Nacella, I believe, is the guy who always uh, controlled it. Yeah. At so. least for in recent years, right? But it's never had its own CEO. So it has a president, but now it's going to have a president and a CEO. Hmm. Interesting. I mean, I mean, can you can you get any higher than six hundred and fifty k for a uh, you know international trip for in business? Don't tempt him. <laughs> I think it's the highest number I've ever seen on 
about redemption. We we were doing some searching and we found 650k for I think it was Trans Pacific, um, but it was in J. So it was one wide business class ticket. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a lot. It's it's a lot. Yeah, it's more than I'm ready to pay. So. Um, anything uh, else? Yeah, you know, not not quite as bad as some of the flying blue rates, though. So. That's that's true. Yeah. Uh, is there anything else you guys wanted to talk about, chat about? And I know in the bonus we're going to talk a little bit about Japan, some South Africa stuff, and uh, business class seat lawsuits. Uh, but if there's anything else you guys want to talk about in the regular show, we can do it no. now. No. Well, if you want to hear those bonus topics, you can subscribe or uh, Patre- on Patreon and, and support the show. Uh, or if you don't have to, you can just tweet us, ask questions. Love to hear comments. Um, and we'll talk to you guys in the next one. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Take care. Happy travels.